ridiculous amount of time on Zoom, uh, we, we kind of had to cut that uh, discussion and dialogue uh, uh, probably a little shorter than we would have expected, uh, just given so many topics and so many discussions. And we hope that we'll have a repeat performance today. Our second C um, is uh, one that is very, very important, um, that is consciousness. And I will uh, let our host and moderator for the evening tell you a lot more about it, but I just want to express how excited we are to see you all. It's an incredible turnout. We have, it looks like, pushing 200 participants on Zoom with us. So we hope that um, you will be engaged and uh, asking lots and lots of questions. Uh, my colleague, whom I'll introduce in a second, will be moderating the discussion, and I will help moderate also some of the questions in the chat in the later part of this uh, program. But without further ado, let me introduce uh, Professor Amal Alashkar, uh, my colleague, and actually the, the really the brain behind the, this series on operations. So this is kind of really her vision, and uh, we're delighted that she's going to uh, host the, the second uh, uh, session in this series and uh, be asking our speakers today, introducing and asking our speakers today, all the riveting questions you're expecting to be asked about consciousness. So with that, let me turn it over to Professor Alashkar. Thank you, Mike. Good evening. Thank you everyone for joining us in the second panel of our UCI dialogue series. Today, we discuss a topic that has occupied the humans for centuries. Philosophers, psychologists, then neuroscientists, physicists, and recently computer and artificial intelligence scientists, all are banging their forehead against this mystery wall dwelling to answer questions on the nature of consciousness and mind-body problem. When and why consciousness emerged and how it evolved? What's the relation between consciousness and physical world, consciousness and life, consciousness and free will? In my search for a definition of consciousness, I found this definition in the Macmillan Dictionary of Psychology edition 1989. So Stuart Sutherland defines consciousness as the having of perceptions, thoughts, and feelings, awareness. But then he adds, consciousness is fascinating but elusive phenomenon. It is impossible to specify what it is, what it does, or why it has evolved. Nothing worth reading has been written on it. I hope I didn't depress you with this definition. We might not resolve the mystery of consciousness today. The good news, we have terrific panelists who will dive into a genuine dialogue, which will be thought provoking and definitely worth listening. Are you hearing echo? No, it's good. So. Yes, hearing let an me echo. introduce. Oh, OK. Just. I, um, I'm, I will go ahead and just make sure that uh, all other um, uh, attendees are muted. I think we're okay now. Okay. But I'll keep okay. a good eye out for that. Yeah. Thank you. So let me introduce our speakers. Yama Akbari is an assistant professor of neurology. Yama splits his time between clinical duties, taking care of patients in the neurointensive care unit, and running a research lab that's focused on consciousness coma, and cardiac arrest, resuscitation. Donald Hoffman is a professor of cognitive sciences with joint appointment in philosophy department. Donald studies consciousness, virtual, visual perception, and evolutionary psychology using mathematical models. We have Megan Peters. Megan is assistant professor of computational cognitive neuroscience who studies perception and the subjective experiences that accompany the brain's ability to understand what we see and make sense of the world around us. We have Teresa. Teresa Tenenbaum is an assistant professor of informatics. Her work uses a diverse technologies and media to understand the emerging possibilities for digital storytelling as a tool for expanding people's experience horizons. So 
As usual, our conversation will have three uh, parts. In the first part, I would like to invite our panelists to talk about their research and work as they relate to consciousness. In the second part, we will kick off the conversation asking questions so our speakers dive in depth into their discussions. And in the third part, we will open up the floor to give uh, our audience the opportunity to ask questions to our panelists. So please, you are welcome to come up with your questions. Please put your questions on the chat and Mike and I will monitor the chat. So with alph alphabetical order, Yama, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I'm going to also share my uh, screen for everybody. So on my uh, laptop, so let me try to do this here. Can people see my screen here? Okay. Um, so my name, uh, my sorry, Amal. How much time do I have for, for the quick introduction? So around ten minutes. Two two minutes. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. So, uh, ten ten minutes. Oh, oh, ten minutes. Okay. Yeah. So my name is uh, Yama Akbari. Um, I'm a uh, neurologist, uh, uh, and uh, I trained in critical care thereafter um, for a, a two-year fellowship. And so I'm, I'm what you call a neurointensive care doctor or a neurointensivist or a critical care neurologist. They're all kind of the same. Um, and uh, I primarily, I split my time between the hospital and the medical center and uh, the main campus. Um, and so uh, the type of patients that I care about in the, that I take care of in the neurointensive care unit um, look kind of like this. Um, as you can see, they're, they're in, on a lot of uh, life support. Um, and the key question we always have is, do they have consciousness or not? And unlike the, the heart or other parts, the, the brain can't talk to us when, when there's lack of consciousness. Um, when we have chest pain, of course, we, we complain of chest, you know, if we have a heart attack, we complain of chest pain, but when the brain is affected, it's hard for us to complain that, you know, I, have, I lack consciousness, right? I'm having a stroke. So in order to get around this, we have patients on multimodal monitoring, a lot of different kinds of multimodal monitoring that are depicted here, um, such as EEG, and uh, uh, several different other types of monitors to, um, I'll mention some more later, to try to um, uh, learn about the brain while a patient lacks consciousness. Um, so uh, how, what is the definition of consciousness? So consciousness, the way a neurologist and uh, you know, pe people like me who, who work with patients who, who, are, uh, who lack consciousness, typically define consciousness as having both arousal and awareness. And you need both of these in order to, what we say, have conscious. So a normal person is on the left spectrum here. Uh, there's arousal, full arousal, full awareness, and they have consciousness. Now, in states of a coma or sleep or anesthesia, the arousal goes to zero almost, and the awareness also uh, decreases. And so when this happens, uh, the patient, we say, is lacks consciousness. Some patients have, are fully awake. They're, they have full arousal, but they are not aware of their environment. And these patients, which we commonly see, are in what we call a vegetative state. And then there's what we call a minimally conscious state where patients' arousals kind of go up and down, um, and the awareness can go up and down. And then finally, I do want to point out to this phenomenon called locked-in syndrome here, which is a people who have full arousal, full awareness, but they look like they may not have arousal or awareness because they are in what we call locked in state, which means they can't move their, their body. It's basically um, like a really awful spinal cord injury, but much worse because it affects the brain stem as well. So they can't even move their, their, their um, facial muscles, maybe a few, a little bit of their facial muscles. Um, so, so we basically define um, consciousness in this kind of spectrum where drowsy, is when when person starts to lose a little bit of consciousness, stupor, where they need repetitive stimulation, physical stimulation, and a coma. And I mentioned vegetative, minimally conscious, and locked-in syndrome. And I do want to make people aware of the phenomenon of brain death, which um, people like me see very commonly, um, which we can talk about later um, if if uh, people are interested. So again, this is how our patients look in the ICU, and to study this more 
in a more detailed fashion in our lab, we built essentially an animal model of this, um, which is an, an animal uh, in, in, on uh, various types of life support with monitoring of the brain and various other organs um, that mimics a lot of the features that we have in the um, ICU setting. Um, and so in, we take the questions from the ICU setting, we bring them back to the animal setting um, to test them in a more controlled fashion. We do a lot of um, analysis on the data, what we call signal processing uh, of the brain. We try to look for what's happening inside the brain by looking at the proteins and you know, the, the genetic expression of, ge of genes. Um, and then we take those questions back to try to understand the brain better in the patients. And so we we also use some novel devices in the ICU setting. Um, I, uh, some are invasive where we have to drill a hole in the head and monitor the brain. Some are non-invasive um, that are depicted here. Uh, and, and some of them are very novel to try to get more information because it's a very hard organ to study. And so, um, so we get a lot of information, just like in the ICU setting, we get a lot of information from our animals. Um, we have a lot of optical imaging techniques that we use as well. And I do want to point out that in our lab, one of the unique features is that we can study a uh, complete lack of consciousness, uh, the worst of the worst, which is cardiac arrest. And that's unfortunately something that I see. In fact, uh, today I've had, a, I've had a patient who, su who suffered cardiac arrest a couple of times. And so we have to bring them back. And one of the key questions we're interested in is what happens during death? So we are interested in death and we study this what happens during death, what happens right before death, what happens after we bring back a, a, a patient alive. And so there's different, definitely neural markers of consciousness that we look for and what happens when we're, when we're dying and what happens um, uh, whether we have brain activity during death. And, and uh, without taking much time, I just wanna show you just one or two pieces of data that will convince you hopefully that um, the, the, the death process is a very dynamic process that we uh, indeed, we may have consciousness in some aspects of it. Um, uh, and so this is, an, uh, for example, an animal that is suffering a cardiac arrest, just like our patients suffer cardiac arrest. And the, the signal, as you can see, goes flat here. The blood pressure goes flat here. Um, and so we are interested in, in, in Excuse me. In this area here, when the when when we lose consciousness, right around here, when the when the brain is, uh, waves are going completely flat, what we've noticed is that there is significant what we call connectivity uh, in the brain. And so this is an example of one of the ways that we can study consciousness uh, in in our research lab, um, where we here we show um, this animal's left frontal and right fr frontal um, lobes. Uh, have right during a certain phase of cardiac arrest, there is a bump. And if we zoom in on this, it's a pretty big bump. So this red area here ind indicates a higher level of con connections or connectivity uh, in the frontal lobes talking to each other for about 10 or 15 seconds. And in fact, um, there's different levels of blood flow changes that happen as well when, during this uh, time. And in fact, um, we also see this in various different settings and this is actually one of, one of my patients who passed away on EEG monitoring. And we saw the same thing in, in this specific patient where there's, even though the EEG is going flat, there's a level, there's a, a moment where there's a connectivity going, going on. Um, and so even during death, um, we, uh, I wanna uh, mention that during, even this is another patient that had the, the same type of situation um, and during the, the death process, there is a connections that we think may be a marker of consciousness. So, so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. And I just, I just want to say, uh, end with, um, there was a New England Journal of Medicine paper last year that showed that about 15% of our patients at any given time, when they look like they don't have consciousness, actually respond to stimuli when we use EEG monitoring and use artificial intelligence um, to uh, assess uh, their response. In other words, when we talk to them and tell them to do things, we cannot see a response. We think they're unconscious, but actually in that study, it showed that about 15% of patients do respond and they respond. The way they respond um, is essentially that they think something and then that we can detect those changes on the EEG. And had we not, if we don't have that kind of multimodal monitoring, we wouldn't know whether a patient is conscious or not. So uh, uh, 
without further ado, I'll pass it to the next person. Thank, thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Yama, for this fascinating presentation. So, Donald? Okay. Okay, so if you have a stroke that uh, takes out area V4 of your left hemisphere, then you will have an unusual experience in which you lose all color in the right visual field. Everything to the right of where you're looking um, will look like it has um, no color, but, but everything to, your, to the left um, will have color. And this is called hemiachromatopsia. We can also do this with magnets. If we take a transcranial magnetic stimulation device and touch it to, area v, touch it to your skull near area V4, we can temporarily induce you to lose color experience in the right visual world. When we turn off the magnet, your color experience comes back. So this is just one example of many, many examples, dozens, hundreds of examples that we now have of, of so-called neural correlates of consciousness, strong correlations between neural activity and specific kinds of conscious experiences. So this is a little bit different than what we were just hearing about, about the level of consciousness. This is about a particular kind of consciousness, whether it's color experience or the taste of chocolate or, or the smell of garlic and so forth. There's lots of correlations between neural activity and those kinds of specific conscious experiences. The standard model in which we try to understand this is the, the model in which space-time is fundamental. The universe began 13.8 billion years ago at the Big Bang. There was no life and no consciousness. There was only space and matter and, and energy. Life came hundreds of millions of years or billions of years later, and then consciousness presumably came after that. And so in that framework, space-time and matter and energy are fundamental and consciousness must somehow emerge. Um, so on that point of view, we're trying then to figure out how, for example, in humans, brain activity, which is a physical system, somehow gives rise to our conscious experiences of color and smell and taste and so forth. So this is the, I would say what 99% of the researchers who are trying to study uh, the contents of consciousness are, are trying to do. They're trying to figure out how brain activity leads to specific contents. And there are a number of theories. There's global workspace theory that suggests that maybe it's some kind of the parts of the brain that are actually communicating broadly to other parts of the brain, they somehow have access to consciousness. And there are various theories that I won't go into, but all of these theories somehow assume that brain activity or other kinds of complex physical activity is fundamental and consciousness then emerges from those complex kinds of, of activity. The, the remarkable thing is that we've been working on this really intensely for several decades now trying to figure out the neural correlates of consciousness and then getting a theory that explains precisely how neural activity can cause specific conscious experiences like the experience of the taste of chocolate or the, the taste of a potato or the smell of a rose or the sound of a, of a saxophone and what's remarkable is there's not a single theory to date that can explain even one specific conscious experience and that's truly stunning. It's not like we have a bunch of theories that can explain the taste of chocolate and we're trying to figure out which one is the right theory. We don't have any theory that can start with neural activity or physical dynamical system activity of any kind and, and show that that somehow creates the experience of the taste of chocolate or the smell of vanilla, not one. So we're in a remarkable position in science where we're, we don't have a bunch of theories to choose from. We have no theory that works. So we call this the hard problem of consciousness. Um, and it's hard because, well, we simply don't have any solution that can start with brain activity and, and even understand one specific conscious experience. So it's, it's sort of a mystery. It's the hard problem. It's, it's a mysterious situation that we're in. And so in, in my lab, we're trying to look elsewhere. If we have tried and failed to start with space-time, maybe we should start somewhere else. And so one hint is that physicists are now telling us that space-time may not be fundamental. They, they say that space-time is doomed, and there's all sorts of arguments from bringing together 
um, <clears throat> quantum theory and Einstein's theory of gravity together that, that suggest that, that space-time itself can't be fundamental. There's got to be something deeper, uh, a deeper form of reality, and space-time emerges from it. So there's quantum theoretic arguments for that that I won't go into. In my lab, we've been looking at evolutionary arguments that also indicate that space-time isn't fundamental. One can show that the very predicates, that from an evolutionary point of view, the very predicates of space and time and physical objects are simply the wrong predicates to describe objective reality. And so, so the idea then is that, that, that space-time and physical objects are not the starting point. They're, in some sense, uh, emergent from a deeper reality. And so the, the work from evolutionary theory that we've been working on suggests that space, our perceptions don't really give us a window on reality. Instead, they give us a, like a virtual reality. What we see when we see space, time, and objects is evolution has given us a virtual reality, like almost like a video game virtual reality that lets us play the game of life, but we're completely ignorant about the nature of the real reality that we're interacting with. So if you're playing a, a virtual reality game, uh, you, you may be successfully interacting with some supercomputer somewhere and, and toggling uh, voltages millions of times per second in the supercomputer. That's how you're literally playing the game, but you're not aware of that. You're just, you just see you know, you know, the, the objects. If you're doing a race car game, then maybe you see the steering wheel and the other cars that you're, you're, you're competing against, but you don't see the real reality that you're, that, that you're actually manipulating. And that's what evolution by natural selection <clears throat> seems to have done for us. It, it doesn't show us the truth. None of our sensory systems show us the truth. In, in fact, I should say it's a theorem of evolution by natural selection that the probability is zero, that any sensory system of any organism sees any aspect of objective reality. So that, that's a theorem of evolution by natural selection. The probability is zero that any of our senses of any organism show any aspect of objective reality. That's, that's just a theorem. So instead, what evolution is doing is giving us a, a virtual reality that lets us play the game of life um, without knowing what the reality is. And so in my lab, we're exploring the possibility that consciousness itself is fundamental. And so we have to have a mathematical model of consciousness, something we, we call uh, conscious agents. And then we have to show um, how space, time, and the brain emerge from a theory in which consciousness is fundamental. So, so the idea is that there's a vast network of conscious agents, think like the Twitterverse, there's millions of Twitter users, billions of tweets. There's no way that a Twitter user could understand the complexity of that vast social network. And so what do we do when the social data is too, too much? We use visualization tools to help us see what's trending in New York versus Los Angeles or what's trending in all of the US versus Brazil. And so that's what space, time, and physical objects are. They're a, a visualization tool that, that certain conscious, consciousnesses, certain conscious agents use to dumb down and visualize and interact with this vast network of conscious agents. And so with that, I think I'll probably have run out of time. So I'll, I'll just stop and, and, and let the next speaker. Yeah. Thank you, Donald. We move to Megan. Great, thanks. Um, can you guys all hear me okay? Great. Yes. All right, I have just a couple slides here that I wanted to share. Um, so I, I think this is a really fun conversation and I, I thank everybody for putting it together. Um, and I hope you all in the audience are really enjoying this so far. Uh, so um, I wanted to start with a little bit of a background about how I got into this, because I imagine that a lot of us are thinking, how do you get to the point where you are actually studying consciousness for your career or you are thinking about how consciousness relates to the science or uh, the, the research that you're doing. Um, so my name is Megan Peters. Um, I'm an assistant professor here in cognitive sciences. Um, and I, I have to be honest, my uh, goal throughout my entire scientific career, uh, even since I was in high school, has always kind of been to study consciousness, to try to figure out why it is that there is something that it's like to be us. Uh, and so from my bachelor's degree in cognitive science through my PhD in psychology, then I went and lived in an engineering department for a few years and tried to learn from them to see what are the state of the art computational neuroscience and engineering tools that we can use to understand how the brain processes information. Um, and uh, 
And so um, I've recently joined the faculty here, um, coming back to cognitive sciences from spending a few years in my, my first faculty position in bioengineering, which was really different. But it, it showed me a lot about, I think, what we have to gain by studying consciousness in a really hardcore engineering and scientific perspective. Um, and uh, it, it helps me at least come to the conclusion that these types of approaches well, they're not giving us any real answers to solving that hard problem anytime soon. We're not going to get there like tomorrow. Um, but I, I don't think that this is fundamentally beyond science. Uh, I think it might be fundamentally beyond our science. That's a different question. But I think that these are problems that scientific inquiry could solve if the agents conducting that scientific inquiry, aka us, are smart enough. And so we just have to see if we're smart enough to get there. Um, so um, my, my heterogeneous background then in psych and bioengineering, COGSci also has a hefty dose of philosophy thrown in, which I think is really an important way of motivating a lot of the scientific questions that we're asking specifically around consciousness and phenomenology. Uh, so uh, my primary interests are in applying these tools and techniques from all of these different fields and putting them together and coupling them with neuroimaging and computational modeling to study conscious phenomenology, the something that it's like to be us, but also to do that through the lens of metacognition. So I wanted to mention that a little bit today, um, how we're trying to use uh, computational and neuroscientific approaches to studying how we think about our own thoughts in order to take tiny baby steps towards understanding those harder problems of consciousness. Uh, and I think that this is kind of important because uh, we haven't really gotten into this yet, although. Uh, in the introduction, we heard a little bit of it. Consciousness is kind of a dirty word uh, for, for some scientific circles, and I think it doesn't need to be. I think that we, we have the tools and techniques and capacity to throw state-of-the-art computational neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience and philosophy and engineering techniques at the problem of consciousness um, and make it not really so much a dirty word anymore um, and, uh, and maybe make some progress. Baby, baby step progress towards solving that hard problem. Uh, so my major focus and what I'm working on is on um, what uh, Donald called phenomenal consciousness, not state consciousness. So this is not uh, the difference between wakefulness and sleep or wakefulness and coma uh, or vegetative state. Primarily what we're interested in studying in our research group is uh, the something that it's like to be you, the fact that your experiences have what's called phenomenal character. So this is um, the redness of red, the ouchiness of pain. These are kind of the classic examples that are given in philosophy of mind introductory classes to, to show you that there's something beyond the neurochemical electrical firing of your brain. It's not just information processing. There's like some, there, there's you inside your head. There's, there's someone in the driver's seat. Uh, and there's someone in the driver's seat, not only in your head, but probably also in your children's heads, in your friends' heads, and in even your dog's heads. Um, and so uh, this is the explanatory gap though, is the difference between the neural firing and the chemical composition of the squishy wetware in our brains uh, and the fact that there is something that it's like to be us. Um, the fact that there's something, uh, that there's an inner life that we experience. So um, uh, there's something that it's like to experience is again, what we call phenomenal character. It's qualitative. You might've heard the word qualia before if you've ever taken a, a philosophy of mind class um, or you've ever done any reading in this. So this is the, the redness of red and the ouchiness of pain that I mentioned. Um, so here at, at UCI in our group, we're, we're trying to tackle a bit of this problem through studying the neural computational mechanisms not only of phenomenal awareness, but specifically of metacognition. Um, so I talked about that. Okay. Um, so specifically through metacognition. Uh, and so perceptual metacognition for the purposes of this conversation uh, is the idea that we can think about our own perceptions and we can evaluate our own perceptions. So right now you're watching me talk, you're hearing me talk, uh, and your brain is resolving that noisy information that's coming in and it's making sense of it. But what comes along with that uh, resolution of this noisy information stream is also a sense of how 
uh, confident you are that you've made the right choice about what I'm saying, that your brain has correctly identified the thing that's out there in the world, me, that's making this noise and, and making these, these visual uh, stimuli. Um, and so in our group, we're really interested in how the brain does this, uh, how the brain um, implements uh, various algorithms and what those algorithms are, what kind of neural circuitry is involved uh, that allows us to think about our own thoughts, to have a sense that we've, our brain is making good decisions and giving us something, um, some information that is true or at least adaptive about the environment um, or whether we're just hallucinating and we're, um, we're thinking that we're uh, deciding to see something that's not actually out there in the, in the world and that um, doesn't exist. Uh, and so um, I think that metacognition is really uh, fundamentally related to consciousness, specifically phenomenal consciousness, because there's also something that it's like to feel sure in your percepts, in your visual experiences. You can tell when you're seeing clearly or not. So you have this kind of thinking about thinking aspect um, that, uh, that happens all the time, uh, every moment of every day about your perceptual experiences. And that comes along with it also its own qualia. There is something that it's like to feel sure in your visual experiences or your uh, auditory experiences, for example. Um, and what's also really cool about metacognition is that we can really get a good handle on it with some of the mathematical and computational tools and neuroscientific tools that we have at our disposal. So the past uh, 50 years of psychology research, mathematical psychology research and so on, have given us really powerful frameworks, really powerful paradigms for studying how perception works and now we can take all of that computational machinery and point it at metacognition. And we can also do this with a lot of non-invasive neuroimaging. So we've heard a little bit about invasive neuroimaging, but also non-invasive neuroimaging like functional MRI or like EEG. So these are ways that we can actually study metacognition coupled with the mathematical frameworks uh, that we've developed over the past 50 years for studying decision-making and perception in general. Um, so, uh, well, I don't think that studying metacognition is going to solve any hard problems by itself. So we're not going to solve Char Chalmers' hard problem of consciousness just by studying metacognition. I think it'll take us uh, one step in the right direction. And so just really briefly, I want to mention um, that uh, in my lab, we're using um, state-of-the-art neuroimaging and computational tools uh, like fMRI and EEG and computational modeling to do what we're thinking of as really good state-of-the-art consciousness science uh, to, again, going back to the beginning, show the world that consciousness is not a dirty word. We can take all of the power of modern neuroscience and point it at consciousness and maybe actually get somewhere. Uh, so just a couple of projects that we're working on. One is this project funded um, by the Templeton Foundation, Templeton World Charity Foundation. And what's really cool about this project is that it's a bunch of neuroscientists and psychologists uh, Biu uh, Rachel Dennison, Jan Braskamp, and me on the neuroscience and psychology side. But then we've also got some, some pretty heavy hitting philosophers. So we've got uh, Ned Block and Dave Chalmers also on this project. So we really have this multimodal approach, which I think is going to be really valuable for not only making progress, um, this one's actually arbitrating two theories of consciousness, trying to come up with empirical evidence that will kill one theory and support another one. Uh, but I think that this will also through open science and data sharing and pre-registration and simultaneous replication, all of the like buzzwords in modern good science, we're doing that which con with consciousness science. And I think that that will really show us um, that consciousness science can, can do good things and, and can be a real science. And I hope uh, also that this is going to lead to maybe changes in policy. So we've heard that um, thinking about consciousness, state consciousness and patients is really important it's really uh, critical that we come up with good ways to measure and quantify and understand consciousness because it makes a difference to patients. Um, and so I think that if we can push good consciousness science forward, uh, we can change policies around funding and perceptions of consciousness science in this country and elsewhere that we're really gonna uh, benefit in the long run. So that's all that I wanna say there and I'm looking forward to the panel discussion, thanks. Thank you, Megan. Move to Teresa. 
Here, uh, I actually just threw it. I, I don't want to be the only person without slides, so I've, I've thrown a couple slides together um, at the last minute. <laughs> Let's see what we can do. Um, except that my screens aren't showing up here. Uh, that's fun. Um, is there a reason why Zoom won't show me the screen that I'm sharing? Oh, yeah, there we go. All right, can everybody see that? All right, so uh, my name's Teresa Tannenbaum. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Informatics at UC Irvine, uh, where I run a group called the Transformative Play Lab. Um, I am very much uh, the odd person out here in that I approach this from a perspective of design research, uh, close reading and analysis of media, and artistic practice and production. And so I'm, I'm a builder, I'm a maker, I'm a media scholar, and I'm a media theorist. Uh, the work that I do tends to bridge digital and physical systems, and so I do a lot of work with tangible objects and interactions, props, costumes, wearable clothing, uh, and environment design. Uh, and the work that I do tends to be focused on designing participatory narrative experiences, often informed by performing arts practices. Uh, for the most part, I make playful XR experiences right now. Uh, in this case, XR is an acronym that combines augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality into one sort of compound acronym. And I do a lot of work that draws on practices from theater and method acting and the performing arts to inform uh, the research that I do. And I'm driven by an interest in identity, identity transformation, perspective taking, and role play for reasons that I think will become clear as I dig into this. Uh, recently, I've been building and evaluating prototype interactive performance systems, uh, such as the one pictured here, which is a, a piece where people uh, put on cloaks and hats and dance around a cauldron with colored smoke pouring out of it, chanting over their magical spell books and transforming themselves into witches in a ritual space. This is grounded ultimately in an interest in the role that narrative plays in how we make sense of our world and the ways in which being able to create narratives and stories informs our capacity to uh, alter our experience of reality and of the world. I think about narrative and storytelling as a form of technology, as a prehistoric technology that, that dates back to the earliest records we have of, of humanity. That if you look back at Paleolithic paintings from the Chauvet Cave in France, uh, you see people telling stories um, that in some ways storytelling predates even language as far as we understand it, that we were telling stories pictorially before we were telling stories verbally. Uh, we told stories about the gods, we told stories about the seasons, we told stories about the hunt. Uh, we used body language to express narrative long before we used words. And this is because I see narrative as a fundamental sense making mechanism uh, that is at the core of, of human socialization, communication and consciousness. And storytelling has been sort of a participatory interactive experience throughout all of human history. So as I am investigating participatory narrative, interactive narrative, uh, my goal isn't necessarily about creating something new, but it's about connecting the work that I do to these deep human traditions that stretch back across uh, the, the millennia. Uh, that we have this fundamental drive as humans to engage in active story, that it's pleasurable, that we find it fulfilling and meaningful. And there's a reason for that. And this is that our brains are, are fundamentally pattern matching machines. And so there's uh, in social cognition theory, uh, when we look at theories of perception and attention, there's this idea of selective attention, right? The idea that we inhabit a sensorium that is far richer and more complex than our brains are capable of processing and attending to at any moment. And it was evolutionarily fit for us to focus our attention on one thing uh, in particular, in particular specific information in our environment and filter out everything else that wasn't relevant to our survival. That from sort of the earliest evolutionary stages of humanity, we had to learn how to attend very carefully to only the information in our environment that was salient to our survival. Uh, as a result, we've become very good at filtering, blocking, grouping, stereotyping, and otherwise transforming the very large, broad, overwhelming sensorium that we live in 
into much smaller, much more carefully curated and spotlighted pieces of, of meaningful information that we can attend to. Once we've structured our sensorium in this way, the next thing we have to do is we have to come up with some way of making a relationship between the things that we've perceived and attended to. Uh, and that relationship tends to be causal. We tend to perceive events that are proximate to each other as being causally linked together, which leads us to narrative. One of the most basic definitions of narrative comes from David Bordwell and Kristen Thompson, uh, who are film scholars. Uh, in their book, Film Art, they propose a rudimentary definition of narrative, which is a sequence of events linked by cause and effect in time and space. And so narratives are causally linked event structures. They follow logics, they follow dramatic arcs, they follow recognizable patterns. Ken Newman is a, is a narrative theorist who has made an argument for narrative being a fundamental way of inhabiting and experiencing reality. He talks about our brains learning narrative scripts from a young age in order to make sense of the world and then communicate that sense back to each other. That narrative is essentially a data structure that we use to make sense of our perception of the world and to recall it. This was central to work by psychologist Jerome Bruner, who in the late 80s and early 90s made an argument for a uh, narrative perception of reality. He argued essentially, I'm actually going to pull up a, a quote from him really quick because I think it's worth, worth looking at that, except that it's gotten hidden behind my, my slideshow. Um, oh, shoot. All right. Well, I don't need that slide anymore. Anyhow, I'm just going to talk to you. Um, so uh, Jerome Bruner says that uh, we don't really have any other way of describing lived time in the world, save through narrative. He argues that life in this sense is the same kind of construction of the human imagination as a narrative is. When somebody tells you their life story, it's always a cognitive achievement rather than through the crystal clear recital of something univocally given. In the end, it is a narrative achievement. There is no such thing psychologically as life itself. At the very least, it is a selective achievement of memory recall. Beyond that, recounting one's life is an interpretive feat. Philosophically speaking, it is hard to imagine being a naive realist about life itself. And what I love about this quote is that it perfectly captures something that the Dr. Hoffman said earlier about the idea that we actually don't see actual reality. We don't see an objective reality. We simply see a, a virtual projection of reality and that uh, there is a probability of zero that any senses of any organism see any actual reality. So Bruner's psychology uh, proposed that in fact, when we experience the world, when we sort of attend to details in the world, we structure those experiences through patterns of cause and effect that we then apply narratively uh, to our experiences. This allows us to transmit our experiences to other people and to make sense of experiences that are communicated to us. What I find really interesting about this is that recent work in uh, neurology and neuroscience is starting to find empirical evidence of this as well. Uh, that there's a, a, a paper that was published in 2017 by Balat Hassano et al. called Discovering Event Structures in Continuous Narrative Perception and Memory, uh, Physiological Evidence of Narrative Events for Structuring Brain Activity. And what they did was they looked at uh, neurological indications of event boundaries uh, in hippocampus activity and were able to identify while somebody was watching a, a narrative film their brain demarcating out different key events, that there were brain patterns that were identifiably the beginning and ends of events, that uh, they write specifically, um, higher order event boundaries are coupled to increases in hippocampal activity, which predict pattern reinstatement during later free recall. These areas also show evidence of anticipatory reinstatement as subjects listen to familiar narratives. Based on these results, we propose that brain activity is na naturally structured into nested events, which form the basis of long-term memory representations. And so there is physiological evidence that this practice of perceiving and ordering the world narratologically is happening at a neurological level as well. And I'm interested in this because as a storyteller, we like to believe that we have the power to change people 
through narrative, that we have the ability to use narrative to affect people at a deep level, either emotionally, cognitively, uh, intellectually. And as somebody who's increasingly interested in the role of narrative as a activistic and, and practice as a practice of justice, as an emancipatory practice, I am interested in how we can produce interactive narrative experiences that actually take advantage of the fact that the world that we swim in and live in and eat and breathe in is stitched out of nothing except narrative that the reality that we inhabit is fundamentally a narrative reality. Can we create experiences that allow people to restory their memories, their pasts, the narratives that uh, structure the possibility space of their lives in order to create new possibilities, in order to create new opportunities, to create new futures? And I think that's where I'm gonna stop for today. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you for our speakers for such fantastic presentation. So now we move to the second part, and I would like to start from where our speakers finished. So I start with question to Teresa. So Teresa, so you are very much uh, focusing on, on uh, the identity transformation and uh, the role of, of narrative in communicating our subjective experiences to, to other uh, conscious agencies. So my question, it, so, identity consciousness self do you see uh something like are we speaking about the same uh, thing uh, identity when you speak about identity transformation does that imply consciousness transformation and so my second question so are we really uh, changing our awareness of ourselves is changing from moment to moment or in the past, so we know like our body, our, every cell in our body, maybe except our neuronal uh, cells are replaced. So how can I know that, oh, it is still me now, that's the one who's in the past. And of course, like I start with you, but maybe also other uh, speakers can uh, answer some of, uh, part of these uh, questions. I mean, I'll, I'll preface this by saying that that my engagement with theories of consciousness is about as deep as, as you've heard thus far. And so I'm my, my perspective on this has to do with with sort of the ways in which we inhabit the world. Um, I think in particular that you were asking about our perception of ourselves and our perception of our identities. My sense is that the perception of ourselves as we understand it through things like embodied cognition and, and social uh, cognition is this thing that we're constantly creating and, and imposing onto our embodied experience of the world. That, that in many ways we inhabit the world first as a body and then as a reflective entity that is making sense of the things that are happening to our bodies. And so this is something you see, I, one of the areas I study is nonverbal communication and nonverbal behavior. And this is something that we see in studies of nonverbal behavior. There's a, a theorist called David McNeil, who has a theory of called on, on, a work on hand and mind that looks at gesture and looks at how we understand gesture. And you see me doing a lot of sort of flailing about as I talk. And naively, when we think about gesture, we think about it as illustrative, right? We imagine ourselves as a consciousness that has an intentionality, and then we express that intentionality and it is mirrored by gesture. So if we have an idea in our head, then we want to represent that image in reality. And maybe I'm thinking about something large and circular, and so I'll draw a large circular shape with my hands. But that's not what we actually do. And like the stuff that I'm doing, all these sort of epistemic gestures that I'm engaged in are actually precognitive. They're, they're pre-conscious, they're, they're ways of being in the world and they happen before the linguistic awareness happens. And there's really great research that shows that actually for the most part, gesture constitutes knowledge production and consciousness production rather than reflecting and representing and mirroring consciousness production. That we gesture as a way of making sense of abstract concepts. And as our bodies make sense of that space, our linguistic centers then explain that sense. They apply language to it. 
It's the same thing that actors study when they learn to become a character. Actors are trained to turn off language, to set aside language, to first be present in the world and to be sensory beings. And then as they become used to giving into their sensory space, they begin to layer language on top of it. And so it's this, this pyramid of experience where with linguistic cognition is the smallest piece of it. And there's all this other stuff underneath that we do first. It's a very anti-Cartesian dualist approach to, to the nature of being in the world. Thank you very much, Teresa. So now my next question to Megan, which might be linked to uh, my question to Teresa. So Megan, you are studying uh, metacognition as a way to study subjective awareness. So do you then think that metacognition is prerequisite or required for consciousness, for being aware of ourselves? This is a great question. Um, and I, I think the answer to this question depends on which of the many theories of consciousness you subscribe to. Uh, so there are some theories of consciousness um, that will posit that metacognition has nothing to do with it and that there's no sense of thinking about thinking. Uh, so again, the, the d definition of metacognition that is relevant here is that it, um, it is a thought about another thought or it is a thought about a perception as opposed to a thought or perception that is about the exterior world. So it's about an internal kind of representation of something that is presumably out there in the world in some capacity or is maybe fully an illusion. Uh, but uh, but it's this, this second order kind of, it is about something that's internal that defines metacognition. So there are um, some theories of consciousness that will say that yes, metacognition is um, a necessary pre prerequisite, a necessary component, um, or that uh, alternatively, maybe there are some shared mechanisms that um, one of the products of a metacognitive process that evaluates a first order uh, perceptual representation. Uh, so let me unpack that a little bit. So um, a first order representation is there's like a, a red apple out there in the world and somewhere in your brain, there's a representation of the shape of the apple and its location and its redness and stuff like that. Those are first order representations. Then the second order or meta representation would be about those first order representations. So uh, there are some theories of consciousness that think that it is this process of evaluating one's own internal state that somehow, we're not sure how yet, but that somehow is uh, causally efficacious in giving rise to phenomenology. So higher order theories of consciousness um, espoused by Richard Brown and Joe Ledoux and Hakwan Lau and David Rosenthal would, be, uh, would, would answer your question in the affirmative. They would say, yes, metacognition is somehow causally related or intimately linked probably uh, to consciousness in some capacity, or at least there's something about this kind of higher order representation that is about a first order representation that does some of the heavy lifting. Uh, but that's only one class of, uh, of theories of consciousness that are out there. So there are whole other classes of theories of consciousness that say, no, it is, it is information complexity. Uh, it's mutual information shared between modules in the brain or shared between areas that represent different things in the brain. It's the presence of information in a global workspace that makes it uh, uh, globally accessible to all of the different processing modules in your mind. That's the thing that makes you conscious. Or uh, if you are um, Johannes Ferencvart or, or Victor Lemma, you would say, no, it's actually the local recurrent processing in the early visual cortex, this feedback that the brain doesn't just send forward kind of, or send information forward through processing, it also loops back on itself. That's the critical factor. Metacognition has nothing to do with it. Uh, so there's no, right, there's no one right answer that we know of uh, yet. It's one of the things that we're trying to actually get at with this, this project that I mentioned. Um, I tend to come down on the metacognition is at least somewhat related side. I think that there's an awful lot of machinery that appears to be devoted to thinking about thinking and evaluating our own perceptions and doing something like, is this first order representation uh, reliable or is it so noisy that it's probably just like random you know, neural firing? If it's reliable, if it's persistent, if it's stable, 
then maybe it represents something that's out there in the world in some capacity. And the system that is evaluating the reliability of that incoming information and our representations about it, that's the metacognitive system. And it kind of makes sense that something that that system deems to be very reliable and therefore likely to represent something that's true about the world, that it would somehow have a, a gating mechanism to then allow that to rise into awareness. Um, and otherwise say, nope, this is just gonna be some random neural firing and I'm not gonna worry about it. So I, I hope that answers the question at least a little bit. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. And from there I will move to uh, Donald. So you believe that, so consciousness is subjective experience. And so you, don't think that brain gave rise to consciousness. So then do you believe that there might be consciousness outside the biological system or even the physical world? And then can you also elaborate more on why you don't believe that the brain activity gave rise to consciousness? Right, the, the reason that I suspect that brain activity doesn't cause our conscious experiences follows from evolution by natural selection. It, it's a theorem of evolution by natural selection that the sensory systems of organisms will have the wrong predicates to describe objective reality. So the predicates that we have of space and time and physical objects like neurons and brains are almost surely, that means with probability one, the wrong language to describe objective reality. So, so the idea is that according to natural selection, what you're seeing, space, space time is not the fundamental reality, which we tend to, to believe. It's instead just a data structure, which as Teresa was saying, it, space, space time is just a data structure. It's, it's a format for, for representation. And it's what, what evolution has given us is a, a a system uh, like a virtual reality. Think about space time as like a virtual reality headset. And if you're playing like Grand Theft Auto and you look over to your right and you see a, a, a red Mustang, well, you're creating that red Mustang when you look. And when you turn your, head, your, your headset to the other side, now you see a green Ferrari, you've deleted the red Mustang and you're creating a green Ferrari. They don't exist independent of your perceptions. And so so you're on the fly creating the data structures that you need. So space time is a data structure. It's not the truth. E evolution, I'll put it this way. Evolution gives you symbols that guide adaptive action, period. They have nothing to do with objective reality. Seeing the truth will only get in the way. If you tried to play that game of, of Grand Theft Auto, virtual reality, by toggling millions of voltages per second, uh, well, good luck. You're, you're in that metaphor dealing with reality, but you won't win the game. Someone who can just turn a virtual steering wheel and thereby toggle the millions of voltages per second will win the game. And so that's what evolution gave us. It gave us a set of predicates that are designed not to show us the truth, to hide the truth, because we don't need the truth. So they, the, just like the car, the virtual you know car that I see in Grand Theft Auto, only exists when I look over there and create it. The same thing is true of neurons and brains. Anytime you look inside of a skull, yes, you will create neurons and brains. And so that's the, the, the language that evolution has given us for when we look inside of skulls. As soon as we look away, those neurons, those neuron symbols no longer exist. We, we, we literally garbage collect them and we create new symbols. And so they're the wrong, the wrong entities to have causal powers. And th so this is just a theorem of evolution of natural selection. But what's remarkable is that, as I was mentioning briefly, that the physicists also say, and this is a quote, space time is doomed. Space time has been the foundational framework for, for physics for 400 years since Galileo. But now physicists have good arguments for why space time itself and therefore the objects inside space time cannot be fundamental reality. We need to be looking for a, a more deep reality. And they're finding it. There are things like the amplitude-hedron, associohedron, space-time, uh, uh, cosmological polytopes. These are deeper structures that they're finding outside of space-time, which are remarkable because they have symmetries that cannot be captured in space-time, so something called a dual conformal symmetry and infinite Yangian symmetries. And moreover, they make the mathematics 
of, for example, computing scattering amplitudes trivial when if you do that in space time, it's very, very difficult. So when we let go of space time and physics, we find there are new symmetries that are true of the data that can't be expressed in space time and the mathematics becomes much simpler. So, so the physicists are now, the young physicists are now going after what's, what's beyond space time. What, what is the, a deeper reality behind space time? And so, so I think in, in consciousness studies, we need to catch up. We have to realize that, that uh, you know, we've been assuming in cognitive neuroscience that space time and neurons are fundamental reality, but, but many physicists are already saying, no, that's not the case. Space time is doomed. And now evolution by natural selection is saying the same thing. So when the three pillars of modern science, evolution by natural selection, quantum field theory, and general relativity, all three are saying the same thing, that space time is doomed, maybe it's time for us to change our framework and how we think about consciousness. Thank you, Donald. So are you telling us that what we are working, I mean, our research, <laughs> will not give us any, any answers? Oh, oh, well, absolutely. So what I'm working on with my team and, and what the physicists also are working on are theories of what's beyond space time. So, so in, in some sense, from this point of view, what science has done for the last 400 years is study our headset. So we, we haven't actually studied objective reality. We've sharpened the tools of science studying our VR headset that we've given, uh, that was given to us by evolution by natural selection. But those tools, I think, are powerful enough for us now to get mathematically precise theories of what's beyond the headset. And, and then what we have to do is get a mathematical model of, like the physicists are doing, they're finding these things like the amplitudehedron. It's not in space time. It's, it, there's no Hilbert spaces. So it's beyond quantum theory. These are structures beyond quantum theory. So it's not like trying to get space time from quantum theory. It's beyond that. There are no Hilbert spaces. And, but, but the constraint on these deeper theories beyond space time is that when you project them into space time, you have to get back structures that we understand, like quantum theory and, and Einstein's gravity and evolution by natural selection. So, so absolutely, uh, I'm working on, on a model in which we have a mathematical model of consciousness uh, and consciousness is fundamental. And, and what I'm actually working on is to show that the long-term description of my conscious dynamics leads to the kinds of structures that the physicists find behind space-time as well. So I'd like to start with a model of consciousness, look at its long-term behavior, which leads to something called affine permutations. Affine permutations are the, the heart and soul of things like the amplitude heater, but the, the physicists are finding. And that will then take us all the way into uh, space time, where then we can try to see how, how particles and things like neurons and brains are, are simply data structures uh, that we use to represent complex features of this dynamics of consciousness. And I, I should just say that, why do we believe that space and time are fundamental and, and objects are the fundamental reality? Why do we believe that? Um, it's not that we were reasoned into it logically. When we were four months old, um, evolution tricked us. We get what uh, developmental psychologists call object permanence. At four months of age, you are programmed to believe your eyes and to believe your senses that they're telling you the literal truth about objective reality. So that's, that was before we had informed consent. So, so what we have to do is get over the trick that evolution has programmed us at four months of age and, and get, get beyond it and recognize that evolution tricked us into thinking that our headset was the truth because there was no reason for us to know beyond the headset. But, but for the hard problem of consciousness, we have to look behind the headset. Just like if, you, if you're playing Grand Theft Auto, you don't need to know, you know what, what the real software is behind. And you can think that the steering wheel is real and the cars are real, that's perfectly fine. But if you're a software engineer trying to change Grand Theft Auto, then you can't be stuck on the illusion. You have to understand that Grand Theft Auto is just a virtual reality. It's not the final reality and you have to look deeper. And that's what the hard problem of consciousness is doing to us. It's saying we have to let go of space time. We thought it was a fundamental reality. It's just a virtual reality. And now we have to look deeper and get a deeper theory that projects into our headset. Thank you, Donald, very much. So my question now to you, Yama. Uh, so can you tell us more about than the boundaries between life and death in terms like of being conscious and a little bit also about the near-death experiences if you believe that there are near-death experiences 
Sure. Thank, thank you, Amal. Um, yeah, first of all, I just want to thank all the, the, the speakers. I mean, this is a fantastic multidisciplinary discussion. Um, and the, the, uh, I think the, the audience uh, can see that there are so many different uh, ways to look at consciousness from all of our backgrounds and expertise. Um, so to, to answer uh, Amal's question, so yeah, I mean, the, I think neurologists or you know uh, physicians, scientists or clinicians uh, like myself, I mean, we, we have uh, our view of, of, of consciousness is, is um, understanding uh, and having an awareness of oneself and, and how the relationship that we have within our environment. I mean, we, we, it's, a, it's a more simple, uh, it's, a, it's one type of uh, definition as was talked by Dr. Peters and Dr. Tannenbaum and Dr. Hoffman, but it's one aspect of, of um, uh, consciousness. And so, uh, to, but to have this type of, um, in order for awareness of oneself and awareness of oneself in relation to the environment, in order to have that, we need the arousal aspect of it. So, uh, and I think some people posted some questions uh, on the chat, uh, but, but we think of um, arousal as being from the brainstem essentially, and then the awareness coming from the cortex. Um, and when we combine these, there is a sense of, um, and, and if everything is working intact, we have a sense of awareness of ourselves and how we relate to the environment. And now that can fall apart during many different um, times when we have pathology, when specific parts of the brain are affected by a stroke or, or a you know traumatic brain injury or a hemorrhage or 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 the whole brain gets affected, such as in cardiac arrest, which is what um, doc, what Dr. Amal Alachkar just asked about. And so um, what we find is that certainly when specific parts of the brain are affected, we still have that awareness of oneself and how we relate to the environment. But during cardiac arrest, eventually that's lost. Awareness is, is, is arousal is lost and therefore uh, awareness is lost. However, there are periods of um, uh, during death and, and, and deep cardiac arrest is considered clinical death um, where um, consciousness may be maintained. Uh, and so we, there are, you know, about 10% of, of, of people suffering a cardiac arrest who survive, who come back, um, report near death experiences. And th there's a question on, on the chat about how the, how the experience that and they, and they, and there's, there's a lot of books written about the uh, people's experiences, near death experiences. Some people, uh, end up, it, it ends up being a transformative uh, experience, but so for some people it's, it's, it can be PTSD. Um, and, uh, they describe it very differently. But what I can say from a scientific perspective is that there is some data that's emerging to show that there there is there's special surges of what you know what we call correlates of consciousness, such as the some of the stuff I talked about initially, that surge during these moments, and they do correlate in time with what we call these you know near death experiences. You know whether they explain it or not, we don't know, but but certainly they're 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 there, um, and they, they they're very short. You know they, they you know in 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 humans it looks like it, it you know it can last uh, you know uh, maybe a minute or two at most, but it could be seconds. Um, in animals, uh, we found that it can last uh, a few seconds, five, 10, 15 seconds at least in in small animals. Um, so what happens during that time is, is uh, we, we don't know, but, but it certainly shows a lot of connections happening in the brain. Things that, for example, um, have been also found when even meditative monks uh, are hooked up to, you know, these kind of multimodal monitoring devices, they also have these kind of surges in connectivity. So, um, you know, that, that one, one might say that might support evidence that there is a moment of consciousness that's even more heightened than, than normal, um, realer than real. I mean, that's how people explain the near-death experience. As much as we, we think our dreams are real, um, people who exp explain those kind of experiences, it's, it's even realer than real. And some people have described outer, outer, uh, out-of-body experiences as well. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're, you know so I don't want to get into too much detail, but I think it's a, it's a very interesting topic. Um, I, will, I will mention that we... In our lab, one thing we found is that there, there may be an evolutionary purpose to some of this. Um, that's one of the things we're focused on um, because that's a key question, like why do we have this experience? And, and it, may be, it may be a survival uh, feature, 
um, because we do find certain features of these kind of coherence, these kind of connectivity uh, spikes um, and surges, they do certain aspects, aspects of it um, correlate with outcome, whether good outcome or bad outcome. That's something that we're just newly discovering. And I think it's very interesting. Thank you very much, Shiana. Well, I have a lot of other questions to ask our speaker, but maybe we will have some time for our audience uh, questions. So, Mike, you want to? Sure, I'm, I'm happy some to chime questions? in, but I kind of want to start a little bit. I, you know, I, uh, maybe this is a little bit of my biased agenda, but I uh, wanted to talk a little bit uh, about what uh, Professor Hoffman mentioned and maybe ask a question of both Professor Hoffman and Professor Tenenbaum. And uh, particularly for Professor Hoffman, I, I enjoyed your discussion of subjective versus objective reality. Um, and, and I'm just trying to kind of understand a little bit better where, where you're falling on this debate. The notion that, um, you know, uh, there's a big difference, right, between saying that our understanding of the objective reality is still fundamentally inaccurate or it's rudimentary at best um, versus saying there is no objective reality, right? So, so is it that space-time is insufficient but perhaps sufficient enough that it has allowed our species to evolve and, and, you know, do reasonably well up to this point. And we need something better now to kind of, you know, go boldly into the future. Or is it completely flawed? And, and you would argue that actually this has just been one slow, meticulous death of our species. Right. The, the interesting thing is that our, our best theories, I mentioned evolution, but natural selection, general relativity and quantum field theory. Those three theories are all telling us that space-time is not the final reality, but they're not saying that there is no ultimate reality. So they're not denying that there is an ultimate reality. They're just saying that whatever we're perceiving isn't it. And evolution is telling us that the probability is zero, that what we're, what we're perceiving is even the right language to describe objective reality. So it's even worse than saying, you know, maybe I get the shapes a little bit off or the colors are a little bit wrong or something. It's saying that there's no possible description in the language of space and time and objects that could possibly be true. There, so, so it's not a denial of objective reality. It's saying that the reality is as different from space and time as the diodes and resistors are in a supercomputer from your experience in Grand Theft Auto, right? In Grand Theft Auto, you could never know. If that was all you knew, you'd never guess that there are these diodes and resistors out of the real reality that you're, that you're playing with when you, you know, turn your steering wheel. And so it's gonna be that different. And, and it makes sense from an evolutionary point of view. We just need the symbols that guide adaptive behavior, period. We don't, we, there's no reason to have the truth. In fact, the truth gets in the way. It's, it's you know, just like if you had to write an email by toggling voltages in your computer, good luck. What we want is a user interface that makes everything simple and hides all of the complexity of your computer. So, you know, seeing the truth gets in the way. So I'm not denying that there's a truth. Uh, well, at least our, our best theories don't deny that there's a truth. But what's remarkable is our best theories are telling us we need to look beyond space-time, but they can't tell us what's beyond space-time. For that, we have to take bold creative leaps, make mathematically precise theories, and then project those theories precisely back into space-time, which is our headset, but it's the only place where we can actually do empirical science. So whatever, we've, whatever reality we propose, we have to project it back into our space-time headset, our VR, and then, then we can do the tests to see if we're you know, on the right track or not. Uh, right track on that. It's, it's a riveting proposal, particularly because I think it actually does have consequences for for day to day kinds of things, you know, and, and one example, we talked about this a little bit briefly before, but if conscious experience is only in the subjective, then the places where we're drawing hard and fast boundaries right now as to what is a uh, a legitimate description of objective reality, say for a patient with psychosis, with schizophrenia, uh, reporting right. hallucinations, where do we draw the line, right? Is that part of their subjective conscious experience? And it may be something part of that, you know, the reality that we don't yet understand, or is it not part of the shared objective reality? And, and in particular, I kind of want to bring in uh, Professor Tenenbaum into this discussion as well. And I'll make it very concrete because you mentioned a great example test that I, I love this uh, work by uh, Chris Baldassano and Ari Hassan. And the idea is, uh, you know, how do we think about shared experience and narrative? as common elements of reality. So can we derive at least a rudimentary version of objective reality based on the agreement across individuals that the same thing tends to exist? And in particular, in that work that you mentioned, um, they actually reproduced earlier findings from 2015, I believe, showing beautifully that when they show a movie, or I think in that study they showed BBC Sherlock, which is one of my yeah. favorites, but uh, they can engage people in the same in way, and right in the neural processing patterns, whether you look at cortical reinstatement patterns, whether you're looking at 
activation profiles, they're largely similar across individuals. Mm -hmm. And other work has shown that the more similar those patterns are, the more engaging that piece, whatever it is, tends to be. So, so it's almost like this trick that filmmakers also are using to kind of hijack our collective consciousness, right? To make us all kind mm -hmm. of think in the same way. So, so the question to both of you very broadly is, can we get a handle on objective reality and what we think of as, as consciousness of that objective reality based on shared experiences? I've, there's like five different things I want to bring into play in response to this. I'm going to try to corral them into, a, into some sort of semblance of order. I think the first thing I just want to touch on very briefly is you talked about the, the ways in which the similarity to previously experienced structures of, of event sequencing produced higher levels of engagement from people. And it parallels a theory in interactive storytelling uh, that differentiates between immersion and engagement. And it, it starts on schema theory. This is from Yolise Douglas and, and uh, Andrew Hargaden, I believe. And it's, it's the idea that when people encounter media, we have two modes of encountering media. We have a mode in which we are grappling with unfamiliar schema, and that's termed uh, engagement, in which somebody is having to contend with new stimuli they haven't met before, and it activates the brain in a particular way. We have to attend to it in a certain way. And then there's engaging with familiar schema, engaging with a known story or a known type of story or a genre or narrative pattern. Uh, and that leads to the pleasures of immersion. That's the pleasure of being able to relax and have your expectations satisfied by the experience. What this gets to is the idea that our brains are simultaneously craving comfortable patterns, craving structures that are familiar to us and also craving new stimuli, craving new sources of information. It's because there's, there's both a comfort impulse and there's also a survival impulse. A survival impulse is, is the, the need to make sense of new stimuli in order to assess whether there's a threat in it, right? Getting back to sort of the evolutionary, uh, the evolutionary theory that, that Dr. Hoffman's been talking about. The comfort impulse is, is wanting to be able to sort of sink into something that's familiar, that isn't going to surprise you, that you know is safe. trying to remember the question now because I think this this little side tangent has gone too far. Um, can you remind me, can you well, remind I'm, me of the other question? Getting back to the notion that there is no concrete sort of objective reality. Right. Can one sort of empirically define that in terms of the degree of correspondence across observers? Right. So things where there's a lot of subjectivity versus there's very little subjectivity. So maybe it's not a a hard and fast line to say this is objective reality and this is open to you know a subjective experience but maybe there's a continuum of sorts i think it, it comes down to the tools of abstraction that we're bringing to bear right that if we're talking about subjective reality what we're really talking about is how are we individually producing some sort of abstraction of the sensorium that we are capable of perceiving, right? If we are embodied beings surrounded by something that our brains are processing, our bodies are experiencing, we have to abstract that somehow. We have to turn that into something that we can then act upon that becomes actionable and meaningful. The tools of abstraction are where narrative comes into play. And this is where I think we get into things that are shared, right? Uh, there's some really interesting studies that look at the development of causal reasoning and the development of narrative reasoning that show that it happens after linguistic uh, development, that narrative reasoning typically begins to develop between the ages of three and five. And it isn't until after five that most typical folks, most neurotypical brains begin to engage in acts of narrative structuring. And it's because the scripts of narrative, the scripts of cause and effect, the, the process of abstracting causal sequences of events out of undifferentiated information is socially transmitted. It's something that we communicate to each other. And so we might each be inhabiting our own perception of subjective reality, but we have shared amongst ourselves a set of social tools that allow us to build a consensus that, that this is the reality that we, we collectively inhabit. Thank you, Tess. Uh, Don, do you have a um, uh, response to that? Or, or how do you think about this notion that, that there are some of these elements that are 
that are shared and, and can create some sort of uh, uh, reality that we can ground ourselves in. Yes, I, I think that that agrees very much with the research that I'm doing, that we're looking at uh, interactions of conscious agents and how they work together to start to create a shared reality. And there's some work here at UCI, uh, Lewis Nerens and uh, Kimberly Jamison and, and others have been looking at how interacting uh, agents can, for example, come to agree on how to talk about color terms. What part of the color wheel do we assign as red, green, yellow, and blue? And, and once again, you can get a consensus by interacting agents. And what, one thing that they found there that was very interesting was that uh, the, when, when they had trichromats, people that have three kinds of color receptors, interacting also with dichromats in this game, it turns out that the dichromats had an outsized influence on the final color boundaries that everybody used because everybody had to accommodate the, the coarser perceptual abilities of the dichromats. And so they had, the, the people that were less equipped had a bigger influence on the final, uh, you know, the final conversation, the final way that people carved up the reality in terms of, of color words. And so, so, so absolutely, I think that there's a lot to be said here. I, I, I'm not denying that there's an objective reality. So I'm, I'm not saying that, that all of reality is, is subjectively created, but, but the way that we build interfaces to reality can be part of a cooperative process that we sort of agree that this is the interface that we're going to use together so that I, I, so I can interface to the world and I can also interface to you about how I'm perceiving the world and you can interface to me in a way that I understand. And so, so, so that's, that would be how I think about that. Uh, maybe I can redirect it a little bit to Professor Peters and uh, see if, if you have thoughts about uh, you know, is there an empirical nature to this that can be directly measured and assessed? How do you think about that objective versus subjective reality and, and uh, consciousness? So I, I'm an empiricist. I, I, I actually, I, I won't disagree with the idea that um, we probably don't have any sort of direct access to something that is real. Um, I think that I would not go, I would not venture to, uh, to make a statement about whether what we can act, like the level of reality that we can access. I don't think that we know enough to be able to tell whether what we're accessing is the, the true structure of the, the universe or some kind of interface on top of that. Uh, but um, I, I do, I think that there's um, an interesting component here, which maybe we're, we're kind of missing in, in this piece of the discussion, uh, which is that I, I think that the, the stuff that makes up a mind and that makes up consciousness is fundamentally not necessarily the, uh, the neurons themselves and the, the structure of reality that we can directly observe through empirical science, but it's closer to something like information, which is a lot, it feels like a lot more uh, sitting at the halfway point between the, the headset uh, and the transistors that are actually like running the code. Uh, and so I think that, that we're starting to get there because information is the stuff that we are studying when we are trying to study how the brain processes information. And while it's helpful for us, I think, to understand the biologically plausible mechanisms by which this particular assumedly present squishy pieces of what, piece of what we're actually processes that information, uh, that's not to say that this is the only uh, implementation that could actually do that, that there are potentially, uh, you know, multiple or maybe even infinite, I don't know, but there are at least nothing to say that this is a unique structure that can process information in this unique way, that there are lots of other ways that it's, that could give rise to this. Um, and, and I think that that's an interesting way to thinking about it because it doesn't, it, it lets us anchor in what we do have access to through empirical science, but at the same time acknowledges that uh, what we can anchor to needs another layer on top of it, that we cannot just measure all of the chemical interactions and all of the synapses and all of the neurons in a given ner ner nervous system and build you know, a, a, a perfect simulation replica of the brain and therefore understand the mind and therefore understand consciousness. We need to, to do something else. We need to understand the information processing. And we see this very clearly where we've actually mapped out the entire nervous system of an aplysia, a sea slug. And we still have no idea how it actually does stuff. 
it has you know some number of neurons that you can count on two hands, three hands, uh, but but we still don't know how it works. Uh, and, and this is because we have a limitation in our theory of how information is processed in this nervous system or whatever implementation is happening. So um, I, I think that that's the way forward is that we need to acknowledge that information uh, is, is the stuff that minds are made of and that the, the physical wetware is a substrate that that information lives upon but it is not the actual like system doing the work. This is very helpful. I mean, it sounds like really there's two places in which we still have to make a lot of progress. One, um, as is argued by Professor Hoffman, we really need to understand the fundamental nature of reality much, much better and, and have m much more capable theory of describing that reality. And two, even from the perspective of neuroscience, we need to have much better models in terms of describing the information processing architecture. And and I totally agree uh, with you, Megan, about uh, aplesia, although I, I will say that even just in terms of being able to understand how neurons at the single neuron level process, there's still a lot to be learned, right? So we could map every neuron, but it's still sort of a black box approach. We still don't know what's going on at the, you know, we're just discovering now that uh, above and beyond neurotransmitters, you know, there are uh, vesicles, extrasynaptic vesicles that can commute, potentially communicate information. Who knew? <laughs> so, uh, so there's so much more that we need to learn, I think, on the neuroscience side, but also certainly on the, the fundamental physics of reality side. Um, so thank you for that. And thank you all for contributing to it. I want to shift gears a little bit and ask, actually ask a question to Dr. Akbari. Um, there, actually, this question was asked by several people in the uh, in, in the audience, so I'm, I'm hoping that uh, you, you'll be able to enlighten us. And the question is, do you see that consciousness is, a sh the way you define it, is it shared across species? And you've shown, of course, how you're able to tack into this in an animal model and, and be able to, to really physically sort of measure at least uh, uh, processes related to consciousness, the loss of consciousness and so on. So do you, do you believe that consciousness is something that is shared across species or is something that is selectively sort of privileged for humans? No, I, I do believe that consciousness is shared uh, among species. Uh, the question of how, um, you know, uh, <laughs> what 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 order of species, uh, you know, it, it stops. That's that's the you know the the you know the uh, big question. I mean, anybody who's who's had pets um, can um, you know appreciate the fact that um, a, a a loving pet is is uh, is aware of themselves. They're you know for at least the neurological definition of, of consciousness they're, they're 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 awake and they're aware of themselves and they're aware of their surroundings um and so uh, definitely in, in small animals we see this um and uh, the question of where you know how, what what order of animals that 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 goes away where it they're just um it just becomes everything becomes reflexive um you know a, a, a neuron discharging to another neuron whether that's a you know, one-celled organism or not uh, 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 might get into uh, more of a philosophical argument, but but I I do I definitely believe that uh, you know consciousness is not isolated to to humans um, in and of itself. Can I ask you one more? Um, and I think that you know there there may be some. Uh, we can come back to the idea of whether it's shared sort of in its full uh, description across species. But there's another question that I think um, you're, you're uh, going to be able to enlighten us on, um, which is what about alter states of consciousness? I'm aware that in the in the chat you answered a question about near-death experiences, but what about this notion that um, whether it's with a hallucinogenic or, or some other experience, somebody can have this um, very, very different altered uh, conscious experience and, and you know have all sorts of insights and so on. Is this something that you've had experience with or you've seen or can tell us a little bit more about how that might work? Is, are there different fundamental realities that they're privy to that others are not? Well, Dr. Yasser, you're asking if I've had personal experience with, with that. <laughs> no, not exactly. <laughs> Although that's welcome to the table too. As I'm seeing in the chat, some folks are very happy to share personal experiences. <laughs> but, but just in, in your experience as a clinician uh, or, or maybe knowing some of the literature on this. No, that, that, that's a great question. So uh, yes, so with, with hallucinogens, um, uh, certain aspects of connectivity are 
have been shown to be heightened. Um, you know, the the obviously the the, the long term effects and short term effects uh, can be a, you know a variety, but certainly the the measurements that we have uh, that that are correlates of consciousness in, in in aspects of brain connectivity using multimodal monitoring, whether it's imaging or or, or electrical you know signals from the brain, they they are definitely they can be heightened to to some extent, um, you know. But uh, you know, and, and some some countries are are trying to you know promote some of those for specific deficits um, of of consciousness. What I what I can tell you in in the ICU setting. We we definitely when we, when we have arousal problems we definitely use stimulants uh, for these patients and there's data there's a lot of data to support this you know um, that that giving stimulants for people to at least wake them up can help them regain consciousness because again without arousal we don't have consciousness we don't have we can't have awareness but then the question of whether once we have arousal full arousal you know there is other data to suggest that hallucinogens can can enhance that as well it hasn't been tried on icu patients necessarily but other other cases so folks i am told by my um boss miss diana Laughlin here that we're i totally lost track of time we're 10 minutes over <laughs> and I, I do feel like we could probably discuss for a couple of more hours but i would hate to keep you longer uh, than we promised so i'm going to pass it back to dr alashkar and, and maybe we'll, we'll have to wrap up, but I hope this is just the beginning of our discussions. So I'll, uh, uh, Amal, with that, um, I, I leave it to you to close. Exactly. Uh, so I, I, I really, I mean, back up. Um, Mike, so I could go with you for maybe three hours indeed, because I just like ask everyone one question and I have maybe 15 questions for everyone. <laughs> so hopefully it will be like a series hopefully when we go in person uh, back to campus. So thank you very much for this thought provoking uh, panel. It, it was really, I mean, brain stimulant as <laughs> if we can use this to stimulate uh, consciousness. So I can say that. So thank you very much. And I really hope we uh, have in person uh, panel uh, hopefully uh, next year uh, when we go back to campus. Thank you very much. And let me just add one quick plug uh, to not forget our next event in this series, also hosted by the visionary Professor Alashkar on May 17th. And this one will be on collective memory. Uh, so please visit our website. Um, I believe that if you've signed up for uh, for this series, then you will probably get the alerts for all of them. But we hope to see you on May 17th. Again, uh, I join my colleague here in thanking all of our wonderful panelists. Um, you made this a really exciting way to spend a Monday evening. Um, I don't know what else we were competing with tonight, but certainly <laughs> won out the competition. So thank you for that. And no thank worries. you for being here. Um, thank you. All have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.